So firstly, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and uh, interview. It's, it's, it's a real honor, especially with the director of the Science Museum and the creator of the Illumin Illuminating India exhibition. So firstly, thank you for that. Very welcome. Um, so I have a, a series of questions. Mm -hmm. sure. um, the first half of questions are kind of general questions. Sure. And then the second half are specific to the exhibition. So if fine. you're comfortable with yeah, that, we'll fine, go absolutely. we'll use that structure. Hopefully between the two of us, we will know the answer. I'm sure you will. <laughs> yes. okay, yeah. So um, firstly, um, there were numerous uh, celebrations uh, across the UK to mark uh, 70 years of independence in India last year. And the Science Museum orchestrated the Illuminating India exhibition. Why did the Science Museum feel it was important to participate in these UK-wide uh, celebrations, and, and why in this way? Well, um, it wasn't just because it was 70 years of Indian independence, but it was also the UK-India Year of Culture. Yes. And uh, very often when people think of culture, they mean painting, sculpture, dance, mm -hmm. whereas we very much wanted to present science as part of culture. Therefore, we thought, hang on, we're not just going to have some dominated by the, the obvious players like mm -hmm. the British Museum uh, and the v &A. Um, And also, um, we've been thinking about our relationship with India for some time. Uh, we did, in fact, do an exhibition about Indian science back in 1982. Yes. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> uh, famously opened by Margaret Thatcher and Indira Gandhi. Um, Fantastic. And also... Um, Back in 2012, I did a long research trip to India, mm -hmm. uh, mainly in Calcutta, and became uh, fascinated with uh, Indian science, both pre- and post-colonial mm -hmm. uh, science, as well as just the British contribution. So um, we thought about it for ages, and then when we realised the Year of Culture was coming up, we thought, well, this is a sign from God. You know, <laughs> the timing is perfect, let's do it now. Brilliant. And we also thought that... Uh, which is often true with an exhibition, that because there were two anniversaries, both the 70th anniversary and the Year of Culture, that lenders would be receptive. Because mm -hmm. trying to persuade lenders to lend is always difficult. Right, but if you right, have an anniversary right, of or a cultural event to hang it on, okay. then it's more likely to That's happen. smart, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, during uh, the Indian Prime Minister's short visit uh, several months ago, for the Commonwealth Heads of Government mm. meeting. He, he came for a short visit, but in that visit, he managed to fit in a visit to, the, to see the exhibition with uh, Prince Charles as well. So uh, I'm wondering, how did that visit come about? And, and, and what, was the, what was the reception from, from the Prime Minister during that visit and Prince Charles? Well, uh, you'll not be surprised to know that these things don't happen spontaneously. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it required uh, a great deal of discussion um, with the Indian High Commission in London mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, the British uh, Foreign Office because, of course, Prime Minister Modi's programme was insane, like these things yes. always are. Um, but uh, we kept in touch and uh, it became clear that actually it would be a nice part of his programme mm -hmm. um, given that actually uh, many of the objects he wouldn't have seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean objects... Uh, from Britain, but also many of the objects from India were mm -hmm. not in, in public displays. Mm -hmm. um, and what was particularly nice was the combination of him and Prince Charles, because Prince Charles has a very uh, broad uh, and uh, considerable degree of uh, intellectual curiosity and mm -hmm. an interest in many things. And so uh, we thought that he would be interested in the subject, mm -hmm. and so the combination was perfect. Um, in our a brief sort of 20-minute tour, I would say that uh, Prime Minister Modi was very well informed mm -hmm. um, and uh, pleased to see some familiar things, but also some new things. It was also very important for me because the thing I wanted more than anything else was two minutes uh, to discuss the Indian space program with okay. him because uh, one of the legacies we want from the project is to start a collecting and partnership relationship with the Indian Space Program. Mm -hmm. They report directly to the Prime Minister. So uh, he noted my interest, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping with colleagues that we will go to visit the senior people at the Indian Space Program uh, 
uh, later this year or early next. And they will all be reminded that I met their prime minister. <laughs> and therefore, they should be um, on the helpful end of helpful. <laughs> Who expressed great uh, interest in exactly. your vision for this. <laughs> Good. Well, it sounds like a very fruitful visit. Yeah. Um, what, what I find very interesting about the exhibition is, um, it, to some degree, it raises the, the, the prominence and, and, and the, the subject of science in India. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, science has not been a prominent area of discussion in respect to India's uh, global contributions. And, and often as innovators and thinkers in, in, in that field from India are often omitted from narratives, uh, historical in nature. So how central is scientific discovery and innovation to India's history and in respect to India's contribution to the world? What has been the reception of this exhibition and has it altered people's perceptions around India's relationship with science? Well, I'll start off and then... Yes, please, yeah. Um, well, I suppose the starting point is uh, it's easy to forget now how science and particularly uh, practical science and engineering was seen as central to Nehru's vision mm -hmm. when India became independent. Um, I think what's uh, also... Um, tricky to articulate is that many of great uh, India's greatest scientists are not in India because of course they're working in Silicon Valley and many other places. Right, right. I think the also the thing that we were very keen to achieve as well was uh, which is why the visit to Calcutta was so interesting for me is to um, avoid the trap of thinking that there was no science in India until the British deigned to teach Indian, si Indian <laughs> scientific method. Um, and the Mughal and pre-Mughal legacies are extraordinary. I would say that um, one of the most interesting um, audiences for the exhibition uh, would be Indians themselves, mm -hmm. rather than just explaining to Brits generally. And um, we received a number of sort of comments from visitors, most of whom loved it and found it all a revelation. But some people who thought they knew more about Indian science than us, right. they were wrong, by the way. They <laughs> didn't know more than us. Um, so um, the, the, the reason um, also why the exhibition is important uh, uh, is because a lot of great Indian science in terms of archives and objects are in private collections or, mm -hmm. or in um, uh, public collections which are actually rather neglected. So uh, in many cases we were trying to not only introduce it to our audience but achieve what your question implies, which is raise India's commitment to collecting its own scientific heritage. Mm -hmm. So when you go to, I don't know, the National Museum in Delhi, you see fabulous collections of bronzes and sculpture, all of which are wonderful. Of course, yeah. And people think of Mughal painting instantly, both in the West and also India. But India's own uh, knowledge and respect for its scientific tradition is, if I can be provocative, weaker than it should be. Mm. Do you want to comment? Yeah, no, no, I think that's all very true. Um, as regards to the question about the centrality of scientific thought in Indian history, yes, yeah. It has always been there, and that again is one of the things we really wanted to show in this exhibition, and why it is 5,000 years of science and innovation, mm -hmm. when you go right back to the Indus Valley civilization, Harappa, mm -hmm. and, and the beginning of city building and systematic thought and social structure right. in the South, South Asian region, it's there, right from the get-go, these incredible feats of engineering, of mathematical astronomy, are being undertaken right from the beginning. And so through a whole selection of objects and texts, and in some cases, including things like paintings, botanical paintings, we're able to show how that's been the case. And not to do anything as productive as go, there is an Indian science, there is an Indian way of approaching science. Science is transnational. Mm -hmm. The pursuit of science and technological innovation doesn't know national boundaries in that way. But what we could show is that during our history, India has played a key role in being one of the places to, to generate those ideas in the first place, as well as to innovate on the ideas that have come from other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And again, this is what we mean about uh, the India to work in other countries as well. You've got that diaspora, uh, very, very important here too. But the interchange of ideas and technologies is nothing modern. It's not some 20th century innovation that we've become a kind of global world, local global Ancient civilizations all across the world were sharing ideas mm -hmm. and their discoveries with one another, and India was a critical part in that too. Yeah, we were very careful not uh, um, 
overcame that there was something utterly unique about Indian science, although at certain points in the exhibition we did celebrate moments that are uniquely uh, Indian, like Jagad and the idea of, you know, uh, frugal yes. uh, innovation, which actually is difficult to find any civilization mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the parallel. Of course, the other thing that one should uh, mention is uh, uh, the sort of fundamental question that I'd expect an Oxford person to ask, <laughs> first of all, which is, what is India? Mm -hmm. um, um, because the point about uh, India in the exhibition, it's the Indus Valley civilization, it's India in a broad sense. And for those hundreds and hundreds of years we're talking about, the you know long before British India or indeed the modern state was concerned, um, we're looking at the whole continent. Uh, and that um, could have been tricky, but I think actually was fine in the end because we both celebrate uh, the civilization, but also the particular priorities of modern India, most obviously steel, space, and uh, IT. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because... The exhibition itself is quite an ambitious exhibition. I mean, you've boldly tried to cover 5,000 years of, of science and innovation in India. For instance, as you mentioned, you have exhibits from the Indus Valley Civilization, uh, people fashioned standardized weights around 4,000 years ago, if I'm correct, according to what I read. Um, and, and you span to like modern figures like Jagadish Chandra Bose, who's considered you know, the, the father of modern science in India now. Uh, how did you manage to accomplish this? And, 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 and did you not think oh, maybe we're being overly ambitious with this venture? Well, <laughs> I've never known 5,000 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, th think that the thing about exhibitions is that the exhibition you present is very rarely the thing you first thought of doing. So uh, at first we thought we would do uh, just perhaps uh, an exhibition about one Indian city. So we thought we would do perhaps the history of Bangalore, which is an extraordinary phenomenon in the history of mm -hmm. IT. Uh, then we thought we would do just India after 1947. Uh, but we felt that as it was such a long time since we'd worked with India, that we would do... Um, what I would describe as the ultimate tasting menu. We, 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 would, we would do a bit of, of, of everything over, mm -hmm, over many mm -hmm. centuries. And um, our plan in future years is to dive into greater detail. Um, although you say the exhibition is uh, ambitious, and it certainly is in terms of the quality of objects and time span, uh, we could have made it even bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we felt that actually in the time frame, and also given the logistics, that it was quite big enough. Um, I think uh, the thing I was worried about, which fortunately um, was not a reaction from the audience, is that you could say trying to do uh, s uh, such an enormous um, history in one space might lack respect. Mm -hmm. um, I remember years ago, the Royal Academy did a very big exhibition called The Art of Africa. Mm -hmm. And although it was a big exhibition, a lot of people were rather offended by the exhibition, saying, look, Africa is so vast and its history is so right. extraordinary, that to do one exhibition and claim it's definitive is slightly insulting. And I don't think that at any stage we have claimed that the exhibition was the definitive history right. of Indian science. Right. It was really uh, a taster, both for the Indian community in the UK, but also for a huge audience here who would be starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. Yes, no, that's exactly it. It really gave us an opportunity to draw out s some highlights. <laughs> and that's really what we're doing. Showcasing some of the highlights of India's contribution, some of the really great moments and some of the unexpected moments. Particularly Brilliant. in kind of the area of technological innovation where these are, these are not grand achievements in a single object, but actually what they do and what they mean within a society becomes very important and which was actually one of the in suggestion for inclusion and I really love was the Dubba, Tiffin Tims, mm -hmm. behind which there is an incredibly complex network at work um, in order to make this thing livable. As an object it's so unassuming but actually for technological innovation and for systems design right. it's phenomenal. So we really got to draw on the breadth of things from across all the scientific disciplines across a whole range of historical periods and just just draw attention to the variety of ways in which India has had an impact. I think the other thing which is very important about the underlying approach to the exhibition, which I 
I think helped it come together coherently is the worst kind of exhibition would be a chronological history. Uh, right. <laughs> so the exhibition worked by theme. So, for example, one of the earlier themes was astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, was uh, Sorry, observation. And so you have everything from early Indian um, observation to the space program, mm -hmm. making the point that whilst there is nothing uh, utterly uh, unique and out of this world about Indian science, what is striking is how certain themes recur over time. And, and, and that's a rather interesting way of looking at Indian science, that themes that were true of the Mughal um, uh, emperors are true of British colonialism and also mm -hmm. post-1947. Um, and I think that's why it worked. If one had tried to do a definitive history, right, right. there would never be enough space, but also it would be the most boring oh, account yes. of Indian, uh, uh, Indian <laughs> achievements. So, so you would have um, samples from different historical areas yes. that are revolving around a specific theme. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I think yeah. also um, what I would argue is that um, it's a very unfortunate way of looking at any his historical subject to divide uh, the world in a sort of binary fashion between uh, the past and now. Mm -hmm. And in my experience of all scientists I've ever met, they often have a profound uh, understanding of the history of their subject. Mm. So the question uh, one might ask is that had J.C. Bose, for example, uh, gone to the exhibition, would he have seen things in the exhibition that he knew about and respected and resonated with his own thinking? I'm pretty confident that he would have done. And mm -hmm. that's the point about scientists, that actually they're aware of their um, role in the continuum of science rather than just their own particular skill and genius. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. What, um, okay, let's, let's see how to phrase this, but inevitably working with an exhibition like this, you've had to work with institutions from here. I, I know you've borrowed materials from the Bodleian Library, for example, but did you also have to work with institutions in India? And I wonder, uh, there's a lot of discussion around uh, UK-India relations and UK-India partnership, post-Brexit especially, and, and a lot's been discussed in, in mainstream circles around um, ties around trade. But what about uh, ties around culture? And we spoke about this briefly in the beginning. And, and what role do you foresee the Science Museum playing in regards to UK and the relations around, around science and culture? Well, I think um, soft power and diplomatic relations are uh, very important now and, and after Brexit as well. And, um, uh, you know, Britain and India have many common interests in terms of pure science and research. Uh, both are, are major spenders in that area. And I think that uh, one of the roles that a museum can play is keep, uh, you know, dialogue alive mm -hmm. and develop relationships at lots of levels. Um, I mean, one of the things that was in a way quite amusing about the project from the beginning is that the... Uh, Year of Culture was under the auspices of the Ministry of Culture. Mm -hmm. And there was one rather surreal day where we spent uh, going back and forward in, in taxis between the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Science in Delhi. <laughs> As you can imagine, it's quite a commitment in Delhi right. traffic. Getting them to both understand that the strange thing about a science museum is that we did both. Right. We were culture and also mm -hmm. science. So um, the reason also why I think this kind of work is very important is that I was very struck by... Uh, quite a lot of Indian press comment after Theresa May's uh, visit to India, mm -hmm. um, just after she became Prime Minister. And my point being that um, relations between our two countries have to be on many levels. And although trade is important, if, our, if we only talk to each other about trade, it seems to show a huge lack of respect and insight for two very different but great countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, uh, you know, an exhibition and a research project means that lots of different parts of India can talk to lots of different parts of Britain rather than simply being a kind of mercantile transactional relationship. Yes, yes. Um, so I think that for both countries it's about uh, being stylish and thoughtful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some wonderful relationships have come out of it as well, haven't they? Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, and, and obviously uh, the Indian space programme, but also I hope over time we will do more research on Indian science with uh, colleagues in India. Right. And one of the things that um, uh, people who are quite ignorant said to me early on is, oh, well, you know, you have to be very careful when you go and talk to these Indian collections because you mustn't come across as some sort of patronising colonialist Brit. I have to say not one single person felt 
that about us because they felt that it was wonderful we cared about their history that we have a lot of expertise in preservation and archival access um, and in fact it was a very warm and happy relationship so um, a lot of people uh, work with these projects give you a lot of advice but in the end it's all about personal relationships mm -hmm. and so you know we now have incredible relationships with um, for example the survey of India mm -hmm. so we've gone from no relationship to a very warm relationship mm -hmm. and quite regardless what happens with the great geopolitics um, <laughs> we'll carry on doing good work and um, being civilized colleagues yes yeah. we're very glad to hear that very glad to hear the positive kind of uh, ramifications of this uh, venture um, Let's discuss some of the key features of the exhibition. Perhaps we can begin with um, India's contribution to mathematics. And uh, among the exhibits was the ancient um, Indian text, the Bakshali India. manuscript, which is on loan from the Bodleian Library. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Uh, am I correct in uh, stating that this folio contains the first recorded use of zero and thus possibly the concept of zero originated in India, is, is that correct? Yes, more, yeah, more or less. It's the, the first instance of a, of a numerical zero, of uh -huh. what we will come to recognise as that circular numerical form. At this stage, it's kind of a diamond point, but it's there in the text in sequences of other numerals mm -hmm. being used for mathematical operations, and that's what makes it so important. It's zero doing the job of a number, mm -hmm. So this is that transition from zero as the absence of something mm -hmm. to nothingness as a thing in itself when doing a calculation. So uh, some of the early mathematicians are using this idea to, for instance, go, what happens if you times by zero? Or, and then you get yourself in a mess, but divide by zero. And so it starts playing a real numerical role. So this is, this is in the text itself? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, uh, the, the text itself, this is in the work that is done in and around that period mm -hmm. and in the centuries after. Mm -hmm. The text itself is really interesting because it's quite mundane on a lot of levels. It's full of very practical mathematics. Mm -hmm. So it's how to uh, figure out journey times uh, between a couple of different destinations or calculate the sales tax mm -hmm. or figure out the purity of gold through weight displacement and things like that. It, as exactly why the text was developed, nobody knows, but it's almost got the feel of something like a trader's manual or a everyday maths. And, <laughs> and how old is the text? Well, this was one of the very interesting things that came about as a result of doing this exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, I used to be with the body for a long time, and there's mm -hmm. been long been discussions about finally getting this carbon dated and establishing just how old this text really is. Um, but once the opportunity came up to do this exhibition and the Bodleian agreed to loan it to us for that purpose, that really put new impetus into finding out exactly how <laughs> this was. And so uh, a number of collaborations took place with Knoxford to actually get the thing carbon dated. So it had always been estimated 8th to 12th century CE, depending on what kind of factors you take into account. What the carbon dating has shown is that three different fragments were tested. Um, all of them from a folio that has a zero on it, very importantly. You've got to have your methodology correct. <laughs> um, they come out with a spread of ages, which in itself is interesting. Not uncommon with Indian manuscripts that they're actually composited over time. Bits of palm leaf wear thin over the years, you replace them with new ones. But the earliest fragment is a comfortable 500 years earlier than the earliest assumptions. Oh, interesting. That's yeah. Nice. So th this... This isn't just important for Sanskrit manuscripts, this is transformative for the history of mathematics in general. Mm -hmm. This is taking a core concept of modern mathematics, one without which you wouldn't have the digital age at all, and, and realising it's half a millennium older. And, and would that dating imply that it's the first known discovery of, of zero being used in, in mathematics? In that way, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's decidedly different from what the idea of a zero would have been doing in some of the other great ancient civilizations mm -hmm. um, in, in the Near East, for instance. India did something new. Mm -hmm. We were also very fortunate uh, in two senses because a um, very distinguished Oxford mathematician, Marcus de Soto, sits on the Science Museum's advisory board and uh, he famously has made a number of wonderful BBC histories of mathematics. So he was very keen to settle the issue. <laughs> and also in Richard Ovenden, the uh, sort of Bodley's librarian, we had a great ally in achieving this. The other thing I have to say 
um, as a quick aside that amuses me is uh, not only is it of course incredibly important in the history of mathematics, but it's wonderfully disruptive to uh, Indian studies generally because <laughs> one of the things that uh, history of the manuscript is that uh, connoisseurial techniques would say, well, we can date it based on our assessment of calligraphy and paper and a thousand and one other things. Um, and then a number of non-mathematical texts also get dated by, by a similar yeah. method. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's nothing like scientific evidence to say, well, you may think you are a professor of impeccable taste and judgment. Unfortunately, the, mass, the, the, the maths text is much older than you think. Therefore, all your connoisseurial assumptions. So I'm sure there are uh, readers and professors in many universities most irritated by the fact that Bakshali is older, <laughs> but I, I think it's our service to scholarship right, right. Um, in, in actually making that advance. Um, it was, by the way, I mean, extraordinary that they agreed because, you know, we talk, we use the word manuscript, but it's such a highly misleading word because it's sort of fragile birch bark. Yes. Um, okay. and, and incredibly fragile. I mean, really astonishing that they lent it. Yeah, but birch bark manuscripts for anyone who's ever worked are yeah. terrifying. You don't want to touch them because you're afraid <laughs> that they'll just shatter. But did you, you call on your contacts? Uh, yeah, we're very close to old colleagues on this one. Yeah. Um, but yes, to have this object, which is rarely ever on display in Oxford, uh, as far as I'm aware, never been loaned to another institution for display. I mean, that's a it's a huge boom. Do you think there's any going to be any immediate revisions around the history of maths as uh, a result? The debates have already started. Did it go? I can okay. simply say, yes, a strong retort was made immediately in scholarly <laughs> publications to this, and Good. Uh, the debate continues. And if I know Sanskrit studies, the debate will continue for decades and decades to come. <laughs> <laughs> as well as um, historical insights, you also have um, exhibitions in relation to 20th century mathematicians like Srinivas Ramanujan, um, who's considered a mathematical genius, but his approach to maths is perhaps a little unorthodox. Yes. Um, he, he derived his uh, insights through divine intuition. Uh, why did you choose to feature him in, in this exhibition? Could you tell us a little bit about him, please? Well, he's an incredibly important man in yep. uh, the history of modern mathematics. Uh, his contributions changed the shape of number theory. Um, that there's only so much I can tell you about his work because there's only a handful of people in the world that actually understand it and I can safely say I'm not one of them. <laughs> However, again, we were lucky to have Marcus on board to uh, be involved and help shed some light on it. But, you know, he's got an extraordinary personal story. Born into a very poor family in South India um, in the late 19th century. Um, he struggles to get any recognition. He is achieving things in mathematics so beyond what his teachers can understand mm -hmm. when he's a schoolboy that they just keep passing on and on so eventually he comes to the attention of local professors in Madras uh, they're really impressed one of them contacts a colleague G. Hardy in, in Cambridge and says I really think we need to you know, take a look at this guy's work um, it takes some time and overcoming an enormous amount of prejudice that exists at the time You've got a, a poor Indian teenager with no formal educational qualifications mm -hmm. being considered for a possible fellowship at Cambridge. Right, yeah. So, of course, there were murmurs of disapproval right away, and it took some time, but Hardy supports it. He gets a scholarship, and he comes to Cambridge, and un unfortunately, owed to ill health, he dies very young. He's only there for five years, but in that time, he produced something in the region of 4,000 equations new to mathematics. Um, Incredible. Yeah, his way of working, his way of thinking, his way of notating his, his methods, unlike anybody else, soundly rejected by the establishment, and yet time and time again, they are all found to be correct. That's how significant his work is, and it's shaped so many things since. But the, you raised the really interesting point as well that he said it came from divine inspiration. Right, um, yeah. I think that's a wonderful part of the story, and it's one we, we made sure to make mention of in various other bits of the press we did around it. This distinction between religious thought and scientific thought that we hold very dear in the West is a somewhat artificial division. And it's certainly not one that you see in the history of India as much. The same people that were doing the great religious works of thought and philosophical um, sort of works of thinking were also doing great scientific work. It's talking about one of my favourite provocations in the exhibition, and I'm going to forget the, the, the correct word, are those little 
astrological tables. Oh, the Panchanga. And, yes. and, yes. and, the, and, the, and the point is that um, uh, perfectly distinguished rational people in India who normally would regard themselves as utterly scientific might quite happily commission such a thing. Yes. And so there are certain points in the exhibition which are provocative. But coming back to Ramanujan, it's also... Um, uh, you know, if, if, in an exhibition, you have to tell some new stories, but also stories of the already known to give people something to latch on to. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the recent film, uh, The Man Who Knew Infinity. Yes, yes. And so, to be blunt, you need in an exhibition both scholarship, but also a little bit of showbiz mm -hmm. and right. a sense of recognised names. It happens, I think, that to include him is complete. One includes him both as a great... Um, uh, person in his own right, but as an exemplar for all Indian mathematicians, in a sense, because had one simply chosen a distinguished but utterly unknown professor at some university in the middle of nowhere, yeah. that's not really going to help the audience. Yeah. Um, but I think also even a non-mathematician looking at the notebooks would have been moved by the kind of visceral quality they have. Um, and also it gives you an excuse to talk about different methods and systems. So, uh, you know, the, the, the great... Uh, thing about his arrival in Cambridge is that his intuition meets Cambridge method and the two have to reconcile and live with each other and that's what's actually rather wonderful about that encounter. Mm -hmm. So of course his life story is very sad and his early death is terrible but also you can say his Cambridge experience is both a tragic one in terms of prejudice but also a noble one in terms of his talent being recognised eventually. Mm -hmm. Another um, in Indian figure who's, who's contributed tremendously to science is the Indian physicist Satyendra Nath Bose. Indeed. And his uh, collaboration with Albert Einstein is very interesting. I, I, I wasn't aware of this collaboration um, until I researched for the interview, but apparently it led to a new field of quantum statistics. Yeah. Do you, this you was a quite a bit exciting more? object for us to, uh, to get on loan for the exhibition as well. Um, it came to us from the Albert Einstein archives at um, Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, Yes, so that that sort of the the letter that Bose writes to S. M. Bose writes to Einstein is in 1924, and what had been going on in the years prior to that was Bose has started to develop this new kind of statistical way of modelling the behaviour of certain kinds of particles, mm -hmm. a particular class of subatomic particles, was shedding light on. Sort of, Remember, it's 1920s on the incredibly exciting work that's happening in physics at that time, and the new understanding that's being built up. But again, this is the early 20th century, and you've got an Indian scholar encountering a huge amount of prejudice in Western circles. Mm -hmm. uh, he was really struggling to get this paper published anywhere, and so he did the, that brave, bold thing that early, early career academics have to do sometimes and reach out to one of the big names in your field. And so he took the paper that he had written and writes this letter to Einstein, and uh, very. Uh, humble and respectful fashion says, look, I, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you take the time to have a look at this. If you think there's any merit at all to, to what I'm saying here, I'd welcome any help you can give me in getting this published. Mm -hmm. um, Einstein is blown away by the work, incredibly impressed, translates it himself and gets it published in uh, one of the leading physics journals of the day. Um, as a result of which they continue to work with one another. So mm -hmm. quantum statistics is an area that grows out of their work. The idea of something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a, a very specific state of matter, it's only achieved at incredibly low, slightly above absolute zero temperatures. Mm -hmm. This is now informing a lot of ideas in cosmology about the nature of the universe. But also, they established that this particular class of particles do indeed operate the way that he described, and they're what we now call bosons. Uh, okay. And five years ago. One of these came to particular prominence when it was finally discovered and proved real, and that's the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. I think the other point about the letter is you learn as much about Einstein as you do about S. N. Bose, and isn't that, I think, also a contribution? Because, in a sense, Einstein is such a megastar, one thinks of him um, almost a parody of, of fame, uh, but here he is doing um, a, you know, serious collegiate activity, because, after all... Know, taking the time to read a paper that yes. someone has sent you, yeah. uh, speaking as director of the Science Museum, I get wacky, weird letters all the time <laughs> people sending me their theories for perpetual motion machines. So I think you learn about both men, actually. And right. um, all it is is one letter, but the letter is a very powerful exhibit from the exhibition. 
what it says about doing science. Mm. That these two <laughs> men cared first and foremost about the pursuit of knowledge. Yeah. Right. And they cared about physics first. Yes, yeah. yes, beyond everything away. else. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. this incredible collegiate relationship, but friendship is born out of it as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really love that. I think it was one of the great treasures that we were able to get for this. Amazing. So there's letters kind of going back and forth, isn't it? Yeah. Developing yeah. theories and physics. It's an incredible partnership. Really <laughs> I think for some of the younger visitors, they found it extraordinary to think that progress was made in a pre-email world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> um, we, earlier we referred to, um, it was, I think you mentioned... Um, India has been a pioneer of kind of low-cost innovations. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my research, I came across the uh, Jaipur foot or the ah, prosthetic leg, which yes, I found indeed. fascinating. Yeah. And, and what's very fascinating about it is that due to the, the kind of social and, and environment conditions in India, they were uh, pressured to innovate and be creative because you know the equivalent Western prosthetics weren't um, accessible due to you know, finance, whatever it was. Uh, so what does this tell us about India and what's going on? And, and, and maybe you could share a bit more about the, the Jaipur foot. And well, I'll ask Matt in a second, but also just to say, one of the reasons I, I love the whole uh, Jagat theme, um, it, because it's rather touching how good ideas come back into fashion. So when I was... Uh, an undergraduate 30 years ago, although it seems like hundreds of years ago, for some strange reason, the book that, there were a small number of books that every Oxford student had read, and one was Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, Degard fits so beautifully into that, and the book in many ways is ahead of its time. But what I find so extraordinary about the whole theme is that India has been thinking in, in a way that actually the whole world needs to think in terms of a different approach to te technology rather than uh, over-engineered expensive solutions. So as, as a kind of uh, a pr approach, both in terms of business and philosophy, it appeals to me. But then the actual exhibits are also just so charming and fascinating. Yes, yeah, they're, they're incredible aesthetics. The fact this was the late 1960s that they're, they're first developed. Yeah, as you say, the, you know, part of it was lack of access to the incredibly expensive, and at that time, much more scarcely produced prosthetics of being used in the West. But what I really love about what they did, and this is a sculptor and an orthopaedic surgeon mm -hmm. working together in the main design, what they, that what they came up with was something that was better. Um, because these prosthetics you'd had in the West at the time were made of steel, they were heavy and mm -hmm. funky and quite mobile, actually. They were what you don't want a leg to be. Uh, so what they did was use appropriate, yes, cheap, well costed materials, but ones that did what you really needed. The plastic hollow casing of the leg that made it lightweight. A foot that has a metal pin structure inside, wooden block to provide a nice solid core, and then the rest of the foot is made of rubber, so that it actually bends. You know, this was really considered design, and that's why I think it still endures. So not only did it cost less, it was actually more effective and just, more yeah. There's more another perfect. reason why I think um, certainly curators here were very keen on this, this story quite by chance. Um, uh, we've had an exhibition on called uh, Wounded, which is a medical history of the First World War. Um, one of the appalling and really heartbreaking stories in that exhibition was the sudden need for um, you know, prosthetics um, because of the terrible injuries in, mm -hmm. the, in the trenches. And not only were the early um, limbs uh, really very badly designed, but also the design you got depended on whether you were a ordinary soldier or an officer. I mean, only the British, for goodness sake, could have such a class-based approach to suffering. And so the, um, uh, you know, the display in the exhibition was particularly poignant for many of us because of the fact that actually it was genuinely democratic and classless, but also such an elegant solution. Mm. I think that's what appeals. Yeah. Uh, it's not just the frugality of the things in the Jagat display, but also the just beautiful an innovative design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And anyone who needs one can get access to one freely. And that is the democratisation of access to medical technology. That is an extraordinary thing. That is, that is quite an accomplishment. Yeah. Were there any other low-cost innovations that caught your eye? I know, I know um, the Indian Space Exploration Programme uh, cost 
uh, well, the, the visit, was it the visit or the pictures in uh, sending a camera to Mars? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it costs Mars far mission. less than uh, how much other countries were spending. I think only, if you could say just a thing, only 50 million. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 50, <laughs> I mean, that in space terms, that is shockingly small <laughs> amount of money. It really is. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we obviously have a strong relationship with the Russian, American and uh, Chinese space program. So I think they were also, can people would be very impressed. Um, I, I think um, Matt may say more about it, but I think that in a, in a frustratingly modest way, what India is achieving is extraordinary and, and is partly the quality of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Because so much about um, any space mission is about the... Um, ways you use gravity to maximize uh, your trajectory in terms mm -hmm. of the slingshot effect and all those uh, well-known phenomena. But also, um, uh, one of the reasons we're so keen, actually, and I said this to Prime Minister Modi, to have more stuff here from the Indian Space Programme, is that it's quietly getting on with brilliant work and not shouting about it, whereas mm -hmm. you know the Russians and Americans would trumpet their achievements mm -hmm. to a high degree. Yeah, yeah, the Indian Space Programme is, without doubt, at the cutting edge in so many aspects of space technology globally, but not not the space agency that immediately jumps to everyone's mind when you're talking about innovation. Um, so yeah, I do think that's one of the areas where there's been great innovation in a low cost fashion. And that Mars mission, very much so they've got another one on the way, second mm -hmm. moon mission before that. Um, and it's not just these big, like, attention-grabbing interplanetary missions that we should think about. Another one of the things we had in the exhibition was a model of the Novasar satellite. Mm -hmm. So this was a UK-India collaboration, uh, Surrey Space Technology Limited, sat sorry, Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, based um, down in Guildford, uh, working on the actual build of this satellite, which is launched by the Indian Space Organisation um, in India and now managed by them for how its, its time is used and the data it gathers. But that's doing environmental observation. So it's looking at deforestation, reforestation, desertification, oil spills. It's, it's an incredibly important use of it. And actually, this is something I think needs to be understood about the Indian uh, Space Agency, is that it is doing really great work across the board. Some of it highly innovative in its technological development. Some of it, the workaday necessities that we have all the space technology. And I think what's very striking, it's almost as if the Indian Space Programme has decided to miss several of the early chapters that people go through. So the one thing that is very striking compared to the other great space programmes is there's been no uh, great debate about uh, the difference between manned and unmanned missions, because India's gone straight for, we don't need astronauts, we're going to go straight for um, uh, a different technological approach. And it was very interesting because one of the senior directors of the Indian Space Programme came to give a talk here during the exhibition. And um, what's very striking about ISRO is that it really is very committed to fundamental uh, values, particularly a, a wonderfully old-fashioned phrase, which is science for the common man. And the point being that actually uh, you could uh, make a huge fuss about sending an Indian uh, into space. Well, first of all, you can do that with the Americans or the Russians or anyone else. But also, uh, if you really want value for money and impact, it's much more important that you deal with flooding and, and, and uh, drought in India right. rather than a pure vanity project. So uh, it, 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 it's fascinating if you compare, um, for example, the Indian space program with, for example, some of the space pioneers in America where there's great science, but also a lot of... Um, trumpet blasting in terms of glamorous missions. It's very striking how, how discreet, I think is the word I would use, how discreet yeah. the Indian Space Programme <laughs> is. What, what would you uh, say that this, what, what would you uh, suggest is the reason behind this kind of different approach? Is, is it due to the environment of India or is, it, is, is there something more to it? Well, I think it's a, it's a kind of pragmatism and yeah. I think also yeah. it's, it's good politics as well because mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, quite a debate in the UK, isn't there, about how much aid Britain gives India. Mm -hmm. uh, and if India was spending a lot of money on pure glamour missions, that would undermine that. Uh, but also, <laughs> you know, India has many choices to make about its public spending. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it clearly someone has thought from a very early stage there was no point going through all the stages that more well-established programmes have been through and go straight to the practical simple solution. So the question I don't know the answer to, but you'd have to ask then, is whether it's a conscious policy or, or in perhaps in a 
uh, uh, way often happens. It's more by accident than design mm-hmm. that has ended up where mm-hmm. it is. It could even perhaps be a mixture of the yeah. two. And, yeah, uh, often the way. <laughs> the, the, other, the other exhibit, uh, as, as, as I read about it, that caught my eye was you uh, reconstructed um, Ayurvedic surgical instruments that, that date, date back to 500 BC, is that, is that correct? So these reconstructions uh, yep. were actually done in the early 20th century and are uh-huh. from the Welcome collections, which we hold here. Uh-huh. Um, yet they were reconstructed from the descriptions that are given in a text called the Shushra Sankhita, mm-hmm. um, which is a kind of medical compendium. Mm-hmm. of all the medical knowledge that was available in India at that time. Mm-hmm. And this is about two and a half thousand years old, roughly, okay. this text. So it is one of the first great kind of encyclopedias of medical knowledge. Mm-hmm. Wide-ranging, to say the least. Yep. Um, but it's everything from pharmacology to, as these still show, surgery. Um, what's interesting about the way they're designed, there are 101 different surgical tools. 101? Yes. Okay. According to the text, there are 101 different kinds of surgical tools divided into two broad groups. But the way that they're described and the way those reconstructions are made is in relation to animals and the, the functionality of certain anatomical features. So the, one of them is uh, meant to be a, a lion's head, and that's a clamp. It's got a firm jaw with which it's clamping down. There are forceps that described as a curly, a kind of like heron-like creature with a very long curved beak. That is perfect when you actually look at the precise way in which it's using its beak. It's doing the job of could, a could it be speculated that the um, inspiration for these instruments were animals that they observed in, in, Very in their much habitats? So. And that's one of those instances where you can see that way of thinking is being consistent with a broader scientific observational way of working. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're fascinating tools. But, and, and again, actually, to refer to what we did, it, it's a um, very common narrative that rhinoplasty, the, the surgical reconstruction of the nose, this is something that came about in the First World War. When you actually bring India into the equation and you look at its role in the broader global history of science and technology, this is something described in the Sushri Tasantita. Mm. How to reconstruct a nose with a set of these instruments. Among them. How did this development in, in India in medicine compare to other parts of the world at that time? I'm not an historian of medicine. Uh, sure, I, sure, I don't sure. know that area very broadly, okay. but certainly from what I have read in, in the academic literature, yes, India really was, was pushing ahead uh, in terms of how early it was developing so many of these things and describing them so mm-hmm. thoroughly. Mm-hmm. It's often the exacting detail that you find in Indian texts. The text and then the commentarial literature on the text and the commentaries upon the commentaries. And the, this is the way that Indian literature historically has worked. So you get enormous analytical information in there. But when you think of Ayurveda, you don't generally think of surgical instruments like this and so yeah, no. is, is it saying that's died out now I th- in, 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 in its usage? No I don't think so at all I think okay. it's just underrepresented in the narratives that we tell about it historically and and again this is why we do these things to bring these objects and these stories to the fore. But it's, it's also a way of um, provoking some discussion because um, there will be certainly those uh, who feel that including those objects is a bad thing because uh, India has many medical traditions, some of which um, count as proper medicine in the Western sense and some which do not. Um, but the history of, uh, of uh, medicine and, and, and medical practice in India would suggest you need a fairly generous mindset in order to understand the history of medicine in India and its contribution rather than mm-hmm. dismiss these objects. Because what yeah. was very striking, going around it with many of the supporters of the Science Museum, who I know are very eminent people in you know, surgery and medicine, is that notwithstanding the animal form that the, the, the objects had, they were of great utility and they really could, they could see that they were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> well, are there um, any other exhibits uh, that you think were central to the exhibition that you would like to mention? Well, I think the objects that we winkled out of private collections in Calcutta, yes. yeah? yeah? Yes, yes, the Roman spectrometer yeah. was, a, was a real win there. Um, this, Please tell us about it. Yeah, so again, this is going back to that kind of exciting period of the 1920s in physics, and it was, if, I, if I understand rightly from the, the story that's described in various accounts, it was actually uh, whilst on a boat trip from India to Britain that the idea first occurred to Raman, which is why he couldn't understand what led say, the, the icebergs floating on the sea to have a different 
tone and colour from the water that was the constitution of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so lighter and darker and how, what was the light doing when it hit these surfaces and produced these different, different effects? There lots of interesting work going on in spectroscopy at that time, but his investigations and also the building of what's called now the Raman spectrometer, um, he did himself, well, which is one of the great things about it, was he, he developed this te technique that using just pure light, uh, pass through various lenses in order to, to bend that light, and then through a sample holder, which would have any given chemical constituent in it, you could figure out what the chemical makeup of that substance was just by the light scattering effect. Um, this is now done with lasers, and they're, they're you know, much upgraded. But at really quite an early period to develop something like that, he changed our understanding of how light interacts with matter for chemistry, for physics, for biomedical sciences. I mean, the, the thing he discovers, the Raman effect, transforms all sorts of scientific disciplines. Today, it's used in forensics, but it's also used by conservators in museums and libraries to figure out what pigment is in a paint. Um, it was an incredible technique, absolutely groundbreaking. But ever since, and he got the Nobel Prize for Physics for that in 1930, um, it's been in the, the collections at the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, but not on public display. This is the first time it's been out on public display for an And exhibition. the only reason, really, we got it in the end is because <laughs> of the people I met yes. in Calcutta, and uh -huh. uh, we stayed in touch. And, um, uh, you know, it's a remarkable object. Uh, it looks quite modest, but it's important. Yeah. It's extraordinary, because in a sense, what Matt's describing is a technique that is not only groundbreaking itself, but now is so much a part of the common currency of scientific practice that um, we were there when several distinguished chemists, the chemists visited the exhibition and they were rather shattered to realise that in fact this thing that was the you know standard part of their life originated in this very modest yeah. sort of hand constructed Heath Robinson as a <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> Amazing. No, that's state of the art and handheld. <laughs> I mean, what's quite uh, striking about so many of the uh, uh, Indian scientists of that period is that, in a way, the way that they're creating their own experiments and devices, they're sort of like 18th century English gentlemen in their kind of private laboratories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although they're many centuries apart, it's funny how the practice does seem to be quite similar. And uh, J.C. Bose was another one of those who built, designed and built his instruments, which I just is absolutely astonishing. It's fascinating. And, and um, this, you know, preparing for this interview was very educational. Even hearing from you now, there's many things that I don't know about Indian science that have come to the surface and, and it's an incredible uh, achievement pulling off this exhibition and my kind of final question is what's next? Uh, <laughs> is this exhibition going to go um, uh, elsewhere and, and are there any future plans for you know India related uh, projects? Well, the exhibition uh, will not go elsewhere because the, many of the objects are so fragile that actually yeah. they had a sort of once in a generation chance to be displayed. But we are talking to India about many projects, mainly to do with contemporary challenges. Uh, in fact, we have a number of things we're working on which are top secret. We can't okay, tell you. But <laughs> let me put it this way that some of them are to do with some of the great health challenges that the world faces, where uh, both India and Britain are, are looking at them in tandem. And uh, we're talking not only to um, the lenders to the exhibition, but also there's a remarkable organisation which represents all the great science museums in India, based in Calcutta as it happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're looking at doing a project that would tour India. Um, but I can't really tell you any more than yes, that, other than to say no that uh, that's one area. The other area that we would like to do more work on is deeper research about Indian science after 1947. And the reason uh, we want to do more work on that, it became clear from the work on the exhibition we're discussing now, that an enormous amount of incredible material is in private company archives. Mm -hmm. um, and very little research has been done on them. And uh, we think there's probably five or six years worth of research. So doubtless a future exhibition will be very much about India after 47. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you very much. That was a pleasure. Is fascinating, stimulating. It's, it's a real honor, pleasure to, to be with you today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.